Okay, well, let's get started. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Mark Lee Wilson. I'm the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub Lead. Uh, thanks for joining us to, at uh, today's webinar, Towards Zero Emission Heavy Duty Trucks in Alberta, Meeting Canada's Climate Change Commitments. Before we begin, the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub would like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional meeting grounds, gathering place, and traveling route of the Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, and Dakota Sioux. We encourage everybody watching to reflect on the territory, the treaties, and the people where you live and work. This webinar is a part of the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub's webinar series called Building a Low Carbon Hydrogen Economy in the Edmonton Region. These monthly conversations are here to provide industry, government, and investors with the knowledge and tools that they need to take advantage of the Edmonton Region's potential for low-cost, low-carbon hydrogen and to contribute to the development of this new energy system. You can see our past webinar, our webinars on our website at erh2.ca. If you go to erh2.ca slash webinars, you can see all of the past webinars. And this presentation will be available there tomorrow. So if you find it interesting, be sure to share it with your colleagues. For information and updates about future webinars, be sure to join our mailing list and follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, and one last thing before I introduce our moderator of today's webinar, I'd like to thank the sponsors of the presentation, the Alberta Motor Transport Association, the Alberta Zero Emission Truck Electrification Collaboration, um, more lovingly known, I think, as the AceTech Project with those that are in the know. Um, and then, of course, the Transition Accelerator and the Canadian Energy Systems Analysis Research Initiative at the University of Calgary. Today's event wouldn't be possible without their support. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Chris Nash, Vice President of Industry Relations and Member Services at the Alberta Motor Transport Association. Um, a strong proponent of research and innovation in industry, Chris champions AMTA's AceTech project and sits on the Hydrogen Task Force. Over to you, Chris. Excellent. Thanks, Mark. And thanks for inviting me today to host today's conversation. And again, thanks to all of you for joining the call today. So as Mark mentioned, today's topic is titled Towards Zero Emission HD Trucks in Alberta, Meeting Canada's Climate Change Commitments. Canada's net zero goals include a commitment to vastly increase the number of zero emission Class 8 vehicles on the road. By 2030, zero emission vehicles will need to account for over a third of all new heavy duty vehicle sales, and that number approaches 100% new sales by 2040. And as you can imagine, that's a very quick transition. And the University of Calgary's Zachary Reddick has spent the last past 18 months exploring what it will mean for the transportation industry, along with Dr. Alexander DeBarros, a professional of civil engineering and Zach's co-supervisor, and Dr. David Lazell, director of the Canadian Energy System Analysis Research Initiative, also known as CSER, at the University of Calgary, and energy systems architect at the Transition Accelerator. The modeling you've done will eventually inform a report uh, for the Transition Accelerator, along with an academic publication. But they're here today to present a first look at their findings. So the importance of real world, world data, like what Zach is presenting today, is needed to provide confidence for all stakeholders in the ecosystem to embrace and accelerate the adoption of new net zero technology in both supply and demand. Another example of this project, the AMTA is leading called AZTEC, also known as the Alberta Zero Emission Truck Electrification Collaboration. So much simpler to say as AZTEC is an industry-led project that will design and demonstrate two heavy-duty hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles that support Canadian weights, Canadian climates, and the long-haul vehicle ranges we have here. Real-world data produced through 18 months of operations will help inform the pathway to commercializing Canada's hydrogen economy. We're working together with Transition Accelerator and CSER with funding from Emissions Reduction Alberta. This project includes OEMs like Freightliner, Dana, Ballard, HTEC, and carriers, Bison and TriMac Transportation, and hydrogen supply and infrastructure support from Suncor. The AceTech project interacts with numerous collaborative teams and further net zero projects to inform the modeling that will advance a sustainable net zero future. So with that, Let's move on to the presentation portion of the webinar. Now, throughout the presentation, please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box, and we'll get to them later on in the webinar. Please use the Q&A box for questions only, rather than the chat box, as this helps keeps everything in one place. 
If you like someone's question, feel free to upload it. And this will help us determine the order that the questions will be addressed to make sure the room is, is informed. We'd also encourage you to introduce yourself in the chat box with your name, the organization you're with, and where you're joining us from. It's just good to know who's on the call. And today's presentation will be available along with all the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hubs past webinars at erh2.ca. And the presentation slides will be available to download there as well. So now I'd like to introduce you to Zachary Reddick, a second year master's student at the University of Calgary. Zachary specializes in transportation engineering. Having done both research and practical engineering and during his undergraduate, his postgraduate now focuses on the net zero transition for Alberta's transportation sector. So without further ado, take it away, Zachary. Thank you so much, Mark and Chris, for such a good introduction. Here, let me really quickly start sharing my slides. Okay, perfect. I am going to assume if nobody says anything that my slides are sharing correctly. <laughs> well, as explained previously, hello, my name is Zachary Reddick. I am a second year transportation engineering master's student under the supervision of both Dr. David Lazell and Dr. Alexandra De Barros. Uh, I'd like to also quickly take a second to, of course, thank my sponsors, uh, the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub for hosting this amazing webinar, uh, the University of Calgary, of course, for sponsoring my degree, and as well, all of our other great sponsors. I'm happy to present to you today this webinar of my master's thesis work titled Towards Zero Emission Heavy Duty Trucks in Alberta, with emphasis on meeting Canada's climate change commitments. So starting off with our introduction, within Alberta road, uh, Alberta's road transportation sector, heavy duty vehicles make up the largest portion of greenhouse gas emitters at about 32% of total tailpipe greenhouse gas emissions, with medium duty trucks close behind at about 25%. So the Canadian government has stated that they want 35% of heavy duty vehicle and uh, medium duty vehicle sales to be zero emission by 2030 and near 100% sales by 2040. This of course is a very ambitious goal that we must make great strides to uh, make sure that we are on track on. Now for this presentation, we could focus on both medium duty and heavy duty vehicles. So the question becomes, why are we only focusing on heavy duty vehicles? Well, for right now, heavy duty vehicles have less sales and registered vehicles in total, with about 12% vehicle sales and 20% registered compared to medium duty. However, in comparing the vehicle kilometers traveled and fuel use, uh, heavy duty vehicles have almost the exact same vehicle kilometers traveled and actually more fuel use than medium duty vehicles. This proves them to be a much more attractive transition focus due to the fact that there are less vehicles that have a greater impact. So let's take a look at the different transition options for heavy duty vehicles, starting of course with the two most familiar options. Let me grab my laser pointer so I can a little bit easier uh, share what I'm talking about. So starting off with diesel uh, internal combustion engines, of course we have our energy source being the diesel fuel from our local gas station stored on board within our fuel tanks to which is used by the engine in order to power the drive shaft. Now the battery electric vehicles are quite different. They take their, directly, uh, their energy directly from the grid and are stored within their onboard battery. And that battery is then used to charge the motor or to uh, power the motor. And so within our first hydrogen option uh, is hydrogen diesel dual fuel, which is not too far from our typical diesel ICE as it is a retrofit of an existing diesel ICE. So the, in terms of the energy source, it is a 30-70 split, which means how we are currently analyzing it is that the hydrogen diesel dual fuel vehicles will be using 30% hydrogen fuel and 70% diesel fuel within their operating procedures. Now, of course, that fuel will be stored within both a diesel tank and a hydrogen tank, which will then be combusted within the same ICE uh, engine to drive the drive shaft. And on the opposite end of the spectrum uh, is the hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle, which is a lot more like a battery electric vehicle. It runs entirely on hydrogen stored within tanks. The hydrogen is then transferred within the fuel cell to create electricity stored on a much smaller onboard battery, which that electricity is then used to drive the motor. Now, 
Each transition option, of course, comes with a few benefits and drawbacks, which I'll talk about within this chart. So starting with energy source, of course, we much prefer both the energy electricity from the grid and hydrogen as they are much cleaner energy sources versus those uh, diesel and diesel with hydrogen, diesel dual fuel. Uh, within the engine and motors, those internal combustion engines are not very preferred and are quite an a, a, uh, inhibiting factor due to the fact that they have quite a low efficiency of about 25 to 35 percent within combustion. Now, on the opposite end, the battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell electric have much greater efficiency due to their electric motors and fuel cells, with the battery electric at about 85% efficiency, and unfortunately, hydrogen fuel cell electric dropping a little bit below that at about 50%, taking into account the fact that there is the electricity transfer within the fuel cell and from the battery to the motor. Now, in terms of refueling speed, there is a great benefit for both diesel vehicles hydrogen diesel and hydrogen fuel cell electric due to the fact that the refueling speed is much faster uh, compared to battery electric, which unfortunately due to the slow charging times uh, is quite an inhibiting factor. And along with that, range is also very important for these long haul vehicles because the entire purpose of it is that it is able to handle these long haul distances. And so both the diesel and hydrogen diesel dual fuel do not suffer from any range uh, drawbacks. However, the battery electric due to um, current battery storage technology does suffer from range restrictions. And hydrogen diesel dual fuel does see some range restrictions, but not nearly as bad as the uh, battery electric vehicles. Uh, in terms of fuel supply risk, there is currently no risk for both uh, current diesel vehicles and hydrogen diesel dual fuel due to the fact that diesel is quite uh, largely available in refueling stations for large trucks. There is a moderate risk associated with battery electric because while electricity from the grid is readily available, uh, those fast charging refueling stations for large trucks are not generally widely available. And with hydrogen, of course, there are no hydrogen refueling stations currently available with Alberta. And that does pose a large current risk to these new hydrogen vehicles going forward within these transition. Uh, going into the last few, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, of course, diesel is an inhibiting factor. We do not like the fact that uh, we are burning those fossil fuels within the internal combustion engine. Hydrogen diesel dual fuel is better because we are running on 30% combustion of hydrogen and 70% combustion of diesel. However, because it is a combustion process, that means that uh, combusting that hydrogen is creating some of those NOx emissions, which we don't particularly like, uh, which of course is a lot better within both battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell electric, where the only greenhouse gas emissions coming from battery electric just comes from the electricity or the uh, greenhouse gas emissions from producing the electricity. And on the hydrogen fuel cell electric, that comes from the upstream emissions. Uh, there are no greenhouse gas emissions tailpipe within hydrogen fuel cell electric, but within Alberta, as our current method of producing hydrogen is blue hydrogen, uh, we do have some of those upstream emissions that does make it a little bit harder. Uh, finally, going into fit for service, uh, hydrogen diesel dual fuel does have a great fit for service because we have the ability to retrofit currently existing vehicles, which are those large long haul vehicles where there is no concern for uh, fuel supply risks as in the worst case scenario, they can run entirely on diesel. Uh, coming to hydrogen, we do have that risk when it comes to the fact that, you know, we still need to build up that hydrogen refueling infrastructure. Uh, but the nice part about that does come from the fact that um, we have you know, much lower greenhouse gas emissions, we have the much higher range uh, and everything included with this, which then brings us to battery electric. Now it's unfortunately kind of poor fit for service because as current battery electric technology stands, we do not have the capabilities for very long ranges. And because these are supposed to be long haul vehicles and heavy duty vehicles that we are talking about, this creates quite a problem with these range restrictions. So let's start uh, talking about the outline. Of course, I've already gone through the introduction. We will be continuing on to the business as usual scenario next when we talk about just how we forecasted the current diesel existing structure. We'll then move on to the comparison of ZEV transition scenarios and then conclude with uh, some final remarks and the next steps for both uh, the transition and my research. So let's start off with the business as usual scenario. 
So to start, we've gathered government data, uh, government sales data from NRCAN to give us a baseline and projected this data forward to 2050, assuming a 1.4% growth rate per year. To turn the sales data into registered vehicles, we analyzed the historical vehicle survival rate using breakdown data from the Stats Canada Canadian Vehicle Surveys. Now, unfortunately, their vehicle survey uh, breakdown for age only goes up to about year 17. And now we have assumed a maximum lifespan of these vehicles to be 35%. And knowing how many vehicles exist within the 17 plus range means that we've allowed, uh, been allowed we've been able to uh, do a decline fit in order to fit the rest of this data going to those last few years. And so now taking this data, the survival rate data, and understanding that vehicle age structure and taking it along with the vehicle sales, we're able to create a stock and flow model, which helps us to create a registered vehicle list with an accurate age breakdown for uh, later analysis, which has that same 1.4% growth rate uh, within the sales data, as they are similar, uh, but we're able to you know, then track the sales within the survival rate to create this registered vehicle, which allows us to create this stock and flow breakdown. And so you can see, just this is just kind of a quick snippet of uh, our stock and flow model showing how the data declines over time uh, to give us that age breakdown. So you can see, for example, in 2035, we have these vehicles surviving at 100% for the first two years and then slowly declining overall. And then we can then get the registered vehicles for that year and then combining the column for all of the years declined, which of course extends much further past this snippet. So to take this data that we now have further, Stats Canada also provides kilometers driven by age of heavy duty vehicles, which in turn allows us to create a kilometer decline here, similar to the survival rate that we created on the previous slide. And through combining these two, we're able to create our vehicle kilometers traveled model, which models are, or uh, mirrors our stock and flow model with that same being able to understand uh, both the age of vehicles, that whole survival breakdown and understanding how many kilometers are being driven by what vehicle at what age. And so this model then lets us track the VKTs traveled by emerging technologies and old diesel vehicles moving forward, which will be great uh, later on within our transition scenarios. And so finally, we can also use our, uh, the NRCAN leaders per 100 kilometers data to transform the vehicle kilometers data into fuel use, which then lets us get kind of a nice look at you know, how many uh, liters of diesel we're using and further on into our transition scenarios, of course, how many tons of hydrogen we're using, which is one of the uh, main important points of focus for our uh, transition scenarios. So moving on, we will start looking into those uh, into our ZEV transition scenarios. Now we do have a few scenario assumptions that make up the basis of our modeling. Of course, as I talked about previously, in order to achieve uh, those government targets, we want to hit 35% ZEV sales by 2030, 98% by 2040. Uh, we have made an assumption that 20% of these heavy duty vehicles are going to be short haul. Those short haul vehicles with an average about 40,000 kilometers per vehicle per year. And we're going to be assuming that these short haul vehicles transition to battery electric. And on the opposite of the spectrum, we're going to assume that 80% are long haul. And those long haul vehicles are going to be driving a lot farther at about an average of 105,000 kilometers per vehicle per year. And these long haul vehicles are going to be the ones that will transition to either hydrogen fuel cell electric or hydrogen diesel dual fuel. And so the two scenarios that we're going to be exploring are scenario A, where our long haul vehicles will be transitioning only to high, uh, hydrogen fuel cell electric, and our B scenario, where the end goal is that they will transition to hydrogen fuel cell electric, the same as scenario A, but we will have an in-term transition technology to help support this transition of hydrogen diesel dual fuel, as we talked about, at 30% hydrogen usage. So we will be assuming, of course, the standard S-curve condition for these new vehicle sales. And we will also be assuming uh, through calculating and uh, data that we've gathered relative efficiency of fuels. And we have our little S-curve talking about early adopters and laggers early on. So let's begin by taking a look at our scenarios and the results of our modeling. So on the left, uh, for the next few slides, we'll be comparing 
uh, hydrogen fuel cell electric only scenario on the left and on the right, we'll be looking into our combined scenario of both hydrogen fuel cell electric and hydrogen diesel dual fuel. Uh, having the both make it so it's a lot easier for us to compare the two of them, and so it's a lot easier for us to see the differences between them as well. Uh, so starting off, of course, we can see you know, from those government assumptions our 35% ZE fee uh, by 2030 and our 98% by 2040 for both scenarios. Uh, one of the very first things you may notice is that the hydrogen diesel dual fuel scenario does have a lot earlier of an adoption versus the hydrogen fuel cell electric. Because the hydrogen diesel dual fuel is a retrofit and can be done with current technology, this means it has the ability to uh, be transitioned to, uh, or taken on much earlier on. And as you can see here, because it is um, hydrogen diesel dual fuel, it is not a 100% zero emission vehicle. Meaning that when talking about our 35% zero emission, we're only ever taking 30% of these hydrogen diesel dual fuel numbers in order to take it towards that ZEV number. And so with this sales data based on government standards, we can of course take the vehicle survival rate that we talked about in the previous graphs and create registered vehicle lists. Now you'll see, of course, starting, in, um, starting from when we had our sales, this, uh, these numbers propagate going forward with only about 6% ZEVs by 2030 and 43% by 2040. And this ends up being about 75% by 2050. And uh, similarly on the opposite end, we have a much greater percentage of these diesel vehicles instead being replaced by hydrogen diesel. Of course, only taking 30% uh, of these towards our ZEV numbers though. And so moving forward, we can then, of course, combine this registered data with our vehicle kilometers travel info to take us to the next slide to talk about our total VKTs. And so immediately what you'll hopefully notice is that there is a, lar a much larger zero emission VKT percentage compared to the registered vehicles on the road from the previous slide. Now we have our, for example, in 2040, 71% of vehicle kilometers traveled are zero emission versus only 43% of the registered vehicles being uh, zero emission. And the same can be said also for 2050, where we have almost 95% of kilometers being driven by these ZEVs, despite the fact that only 75% of the registered vehicles are uh, ZEV. Now, of course, the reason for this is that we have within our kilometer breakdown, the newer vehicles are driving much more kilometers early on, which means that they have a much larger impact uh, in the earlier years of their life. And so uh, now that we have our vehicle kilometers traveled, um, we can combine that, of course, with the drivetrain efficiency to determine fuel use. And so hydrogen adoption within scenario B, I kind of want to point out as a big point of this, as it does occur much earlier on due to our earlier adoption of these vehicles, which then results in some different hydrogen numbers, which I'll then show you here. That difference uh, within 2030 is almost 53 tons a day, with that difference, of course, declining as this transitionary technology declines as we go further on. Now, we'll be reaching of course, about 240 tons, 293 tons by 2030, with these numbers expected uh, almost 10 times their value by 2050, with about 2,400 tons, uh, 2,450 tons, roughly for both scenarios by 2050. And uh, going forward, now that we know the fuel use, having taken it from VKT, we can then move on uh, knowing the carbon intensity of these fuels in order to calculate their life cycle greenhouse gases. Now, both scenarios, of course, show a very large potential for greenhouse gas redu uh, reduction. And due to how they're both based around federal targets, 2035 or 35% by 2030, et cetera, they do share quite similar decline patterns. And despite the small impacts in registered vehicles, however, they do have uh, those new vehicles getting a lot of good use. They do have a large impact uh, on making these greenhouse gas declines happen much quicker. So we have from our business as usual scenario, assuming that there is no change and no decline within uh, the upstream emissions of diesel usage, we have about a 14% decline 
in 2030 from greenhouse gases, 72%, which is a great jump from 2030 by 2040, and almost 91% reduction by 2050. Now, one of the things that you may notice, however, is that there are some uh, greenhouse gas emissions for hydrogen fuel cell electric here. And of course, for hydrogen diesel fuel as well. Uh, the hydrogen fuel cell electric greenhouse gas emissions are subject to change. Uh, as I talked about previously, the reason for these is due to the fact that there are those upstream emissions from the production of blue hydrogen, which causes uh, there to be some greenhouse gas emissions. If we're able to clean up our production of hydrogen, you know, go full green hydrogen production by 2050, then of course these upstream emissions will decline to zero. And as well, uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum, the hydrogen diesel dual fuel emissions for diesel are also subject to change. The current uh, split that we have right now is a 70-30 split, 30% hydrogen, 70% diesel. However, um, different trucking companies have stated that this split is expected to improve going forward, that we will be seeing about maybe a 50-50 split coming up in the next few years, uh, and uh, the hope being that we can reach almost 100% split of hydrogen use. And so um, these greenhouse gas emissions, of course, if that split does change, are subject to become lower, and this might lower the scenario as well uh, in comparison to the hydrogen fuel cell electric. But for now, we are keeping that 70-30 split, and this is what the numbers show us for now. So now let's move into some of the more economics of the transition to see how this impact costs. Uh, using the NRCAN ICF report on zero emission vehicle prices, we can combine this data with, of course, our vehicle sales that we've talked about previously to determine the total cost of the transition, including the additional incremental cost. And so we can see the total cost of vehicle sales per year for just those new vehicles. Uh, you can see you know, diesel vehicles slowly declining and hydrogen fuel cell electric and battery electric taking over uh, within both scenarios. And of course, within our scenario B, the hydrogen diesel dual fuel as that interim and transitionary uh, technology. And so we have these bumps right here, which are going to be our incremental costs. And so while hydrogen fuel cell electric, battery electric and diesel dual fuel uh, as long as they remain more expensive, you know, that will mean that we're going to be incurring that uh, extra incremental cost. And so let's actually take a look uh, at the incremental cost a little bit closer in our next slide. So the incremental costs are similar overall, rising to the greatest incremental cost at about 2030, reaching that um, about $450 million extra on top of the current diesel prices. And overall, the total incremental cost for transition for hydrogen fuel cell electric within our calculations uh, ended up being about $3.2 billion uh, in Canadian. And all of these uh, Canadian numbers are 2019 dollars. If I did not uh, specify that earlier, I apologize. And uh, so $3.2 billion for that hydrogen fuel cell electric transition and uh, about $300 million less, $2.9 billion for that uh, dual transition. Now, while these numbers may seem a bit higher, between now and 2035, the projected carbon tax to be collected for these scenarios by tailpipe emissions for Alberta's heavy duty vehicles is expected to be about $19.7 billion for the expected carbon tax of 50 going to 170 uh, by 2030, and then assuming the same going forward, although that is of course also possible, uh, possibly going higher, which means this number may go up, which overall means that in order to facilitate this transition for either of them, you only need about 15% of the money to be gained from uh, the carbon tax to in order to help this transition move forward. So let's uh, take a look at this final economic comparison, which takes a look at the lifetime impact of CO2 as cost per ton of CO2 abated, which we can also compare to the declared government carbon tax. Now, what you may notice originally is that for these battery electric vehicles, the cost per ton of CO2 emitted is higher due to fewer life cycle kilometers driven. Now, because as we talked about in previous slides, the cost of the hydrogen fuel cell electric trucks are much higher, but due to the fact that these battery electric are not driving as much, unfortunately, they have less of an impact. And so their total cost per tons abated uh, is higher than hydrogen fuel cell electric. And you will also notice that by 2034, 
hydrogen fuel cell electric and diesel vehicles are projected to reach cost parity, meaning it requires no further vehicle investment to reduce greenhouse gases, meaning the choice should be obvious at that point. Uh, however, what you will notice is that hydrogen diesel dual fuel in the earlier stages remains a much more economical option, uh, remaining under $75 per ton early on, uh, as it is just that retrofit cost on top of the diesel cost or the diesel vehicle cost. And so this um, number for hydrogen diesel dual fuel, of course, remains economical in the earlier stages, but then as it still remains uh, a retrofit cost on top and we reach cost parity with the others eventually becomes a lot less economically uh, makes sense. Now I've presented a lot of data on both sides of this transition so I'd like to just kind of slow it down just a little bit and chat about some of uh, the pros and cons of both just to kind of get a more overhead look at uh, the transition. So starting off with hydrogen fuel cell electric, of course, the engine that we uh, that we use for that is much more efficient than internal combustion engine. It uh, is the it is the electric fuel cell, so that we don't have those uh, that lossy combustion. We have no tailpipe emissions, and because it is that electric motor, there's much fewer moving parts, which means much lower maintenance costs overall for these vehicles. Uh, as talked about, there is lower incremental cost on these vehicles uh, by early 2030, which provides them a great benefit. And overall, it is where these long-haul HDVs are headed. While H uh, hydrogen diesel dual fuel is a transitionary uh, technology, it will not exist forever, or the assumption is that it will eventually be placed by these electric motors uh, within hydrogen fuel cell electric. However, Hydrogen diesel dual fuel for its in-term transition does have a much lower perceived risk instead of immediately transitioning to hydrogen fuel cell electric. In terms of the fact that it's much safer with fuel, su uh, fuel supply, the resale values are much more understood, and there is a lot lower incremental vehicle cost within those next eight years. And with the ability for us to transition hydrogen diesel dual fuel earlier on, as I talked about previously, it can also help to rapidly build out the fueling infrastructure that will eventually be used by those hydrogen fuel cell electric trucks. We will have more hydrogen capable trucks on the road within the hydrogen diesel dual fuel scenario, which will provide a lot more benefit to the refueling infrastructure moving forward. And this pro also leads into one of our first cons for hydrogen fuel cell electric, which is that the hydrogen diesel dual fuel retrofit works on those long haul 63.5 ton gross vehicle weight tractors, which unfortunately are not yet available for hydrogen fuel cell electric. Those are, I believe, closer to about 40 tons that are currently available, but those 63.5 that see a lot more greater use within the long haul sector will be available within uh, a few more years. And along with that, these trucks are not truly proven under real world conditions for Alberta, whereas we're just retrofitting those diesel vehicles, which have, of course, lifetimes of uh, proving themselves under the harsh conditions of Alberta. Uh, as well, um, these hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles require fueling stations to operate, which are not currently available, and they will see a higher incremental cost within the next eight years compared to diesel dual fuel, which does put a bit of a strain in terms of the economics. And on the opposite of the spectrum for the cons for hydrogen diesel dual fuel, uh, it, of course, it is a retrofit technology. These are not fully integrated into the engine control unit, and these do require a lot of coordination between both the retrofitters and the uh, trucking companies, the trucking uh, manufacturers as well. And this also goes into the next point in saying that this technology is not fully and independently validated for. Uh, this technology is, of course, currently being tested and researched along with hydrogen fuel cell electric, but it is uh, a lot further along in the process than uh, the hydrogen fuel cell electric uh, trucks are. And of course, it still has emissions. It is not a true zero emission vehicle as the 70-30 split, assuming that we are still having basically 70% of our current emissions still through these vehicles, and it is only a partial ZEV. Oh, so after all of that, taking a look at the ZEV transitions, comparing scenario A to scenario B in terms of both the vehicles registered, kilometers traveled, and everything in comparison, uh, let's finally move into the conclusions and the next steps for uh, this research project. 
So, which scenario will Canada follow? Well, we can't predict the future. <laughs> and so it will most likely be a mix of the two, of course, decided by market forces and technological advances. If there are massive strides to be made in these hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles, we could see a much greater rise in these vehicles versus hydrogen diesel dual fuel. But you know, if we also have a lag behind in the availability of refueling structure, then maybe hydrogen diesel dual fuel would be a lot more uh, attractive as a transitionary uh, process. Either way, it will most likely be a mix of these two scenarios. Now, will Canada reach their federal targets? Unfortunately, the transition is currently years behind. You know, within the modeling that we are doing, we're expecting in the next year that there be uh, over 100 vehicles for both hydrogen fuel cell electric or hydrogen fuel cell electric and hydrogen diesel dual fuel combined. But as there are none currently on the road this year, it is very, very unlikely that we'll have that many in, <laughs> within the next few years. This means that measures must be implemented to ensure a smooth and quick transition, such as the government IMHZEV program, which is a Government of Canada sponsored program in which they are providing incentives to these trucking companies in order to facilitate uh, this transition. And things like this uh, and support by the government, of course, will be very vital in ensuring that uh, the trucking companies will a want to support this transition and b will be able to afford this transition as well and of course finally where to go from here uh within my research and the research that me dr david lazell and dr alexandra de Barros are doing uh, we are hoping to expand upon uh not just to look at alberta data but to look at canadian data as well uh, we're also hoping to take a look at medium duty vehicles as well, knowing that uh, these vehicles are driving not as much as these long haul vehicles within uh, the heavy duty vehicles are. So we'll all, uh, there'll be a lot greater transition towards battery, but the look into uh, hydrogen diesel dual fuel and hydrogen fuel cell electric within these vehicles is also of uh, great importance when looking uh, forward to this transition and this research. And finally, we're going to be taking, of course, a look at uh, the cost of building the refueling infrastructure within Alberta, because as that infrastructure is currently lacking, understanding the costs and risks and information associated with this will be a very big help in order to facilitate this transition. Now, thank you guys so much for listening to <laughs> me ramble on about uh, my master's thesis work. We've done uh, a lot of great work here, and I'm very excited for question and answer period. Uh, if you would like to contact us, uh, these slides will be available later on during the week. Uh, we have all of our contact information. If there are any questions that are not answered within our question and answer period, please feel free to send me an email and we will uh, be able to answer them. But for now, I will stop sharing my screen and I will transition back to our Q&A period. Excellent. Thanks, Zachary. That was a great presentation. I think the importance of having this information to, to give to the supply and demand side to look how they drive decision going forward towards a net zero, this is critical information. So great job on the presentation. So what I'd like to do now, I, I'm just going to move over to the, the Q&A portion. So as I said uh, uh, earlier on, I'm going to go through and look at the questions for what's most voted for. So if you want to go in there and vote for the questions, um, we'll continue going on from there. So there was a question brought in that has five of the votes that says, what are the assumptions on hydrogen pricing at the beginning of 2030, 2040, and 2050? Uh, we understand you won't have a crystal ball, but what, what have you found so far? Uh, sorry, I'm, uh, I'm just trying to bring up uh, really quickly the question and answer uh, slides for me so I can see these questions a little bit more easier and refer back to them. No. So, so sorry, just give me one second. And again, if, it, if it's something that isn't able to be answered, you know, it's just questions that are asked. So, and we also have uh, Dr. David Lazell, who's very involved in this, to be able to help and then support in these kind of, uh, these kind of questions. Oh, of maybe, course. Maybe I can just answer. Obviously, the, the price of hydrogen is, is part of a different study. That's really not what Zach's been looking at. Um, we've been looking at it. We're trying to see uh, to look at the fueling station and value chains that will bring the price of hydrogen down to below eight dollars a kilogram. 
Uh, and, and we think that's sort of, you know, ideally six, seven or eight dollars a kilogram by 2030. Uh, it's going to be a little hard to do, especially with uh, because uh, we have to build large fueling stations and have very efficient uh, fuel transfer. So that's part of a different study that we've been working on on the value chain. And uh, maybe there's a possibility at the, in, in the next year for Zach's thesis that we can try to integrate the fuel price in. But it's, it's really not uh, part of this study. Thank you. Of course. And uh, taking the research further as well, when we're looking into uh, the hydrogen refueling stations as well, I believe that taking a look into that hydrogen pricing, of course, will be a very large factor in determining uh, how those hydrogen refueling stations will be uh, set up throughout Alberta. Excellent. Thanks for the answers. And, uh, you know, as we go through the questions, some of them might be a little bit more ingrained and then we can feel free to, if we're not uh, sure we can answer. So, one of the questions that came up at the top there with a couple of votes was, have you done any comparative analysis with using swappable batteries and fully electric trucks to reduce the time needed to get on the road again? So again, battery pack changed up over time in a stationary charger using an automated crane, those sort of things to get it moving. Might be a little deep for this, but uh, interested to hear if there's any, any information you can supply on that. Oh, of course. Um, now we've, we have, of course, considered uh, the option when it comes to battery electric because, you know, one of the greatest inhibiting factors that I talked about in my presentation is that charge time. And so the idea of swappable batteries has been around for a while, and it definitely has the potential to really reduce that, um, that strain put on these long haul vehicles uh, with those long recharging times. Um, I believe, uh, however, it has, it's not necessarily a main focus of the research that we are doing now, uh, because we're trying mainly to focus on more of the long haul aspect. However, uh, it's definitely one of our uh, considerations within this transitionary aspect. Um, and within the research that uh, we've been looking into, one of the kind of major problems that comes up is that Having swappable batteries means that you need either consistency within the brands of trucks you're having, consistency within the battery manufacturers, and being able to support swapping those, uh, those uh, very large batteries within these trucks. I think that there is definitely uh, a possibility for, within the future, having these swappable batteries to make these battery electric long haul trucks uh, much more viable within the market. But of course, that's entirely up for the market to decide. Oh, I believe you're muted, Chris. It has to happen one time at the event. Someone has to be on mute. I oh, be of course, of course. <laughs> there you go. No, I do have one question. Again, it's a little bit off, but it does tie into your slide of the different types of uh, um, technology that battery electric hydrogen dual fuel can go to. And are these findings also relevant for railways uh, conversions from current diesel electric locomotives and are studies and trials currently underway? Now, I, through the hydrogen research that I've been doing, I understand that there is a large market and a large potential for the introduction of hydrogen within other markets, such as within airplanes and within uh, the trains that we have. And um, like the uh, CPR trains that we currently have, they, they're kind of interesting because they run on electric motors, but are currently powered by diesel. And so the possibility for switching over uh, trains, for example, to hydrogen fuel cell uh, has a lot of great potential, as well as expanding the hydrogen market within Canada. Um, and I, I apologize, the, sec the second half of that question. Ah, one sec, I'll run over to that. Uh, second part, are studies and trials currently underway? Um, unfortunately, I don't believe I have enough expertise within the railway side of things to answer that. Uh, Although if uh, Dr. Lazell maybe has some more information. Yeah, I, I mean, certainly uh, Canadian Pacific Railway CPR has already built, they've already taken one diesel electric locomotive and converted it to hydrogen fuel cell electric, putting 1.2 megawatts of fuel cells on this uh, locomotive. Got a chance to tour it earlier this year. It's quite amazing uh, feat. And, and, they're, and they're in the process of retrofitting two more. So I think uh, much of the, I think many of the insights from Zach's work suggests that there's uh, significant opportunities in the locomotive, uh, much, much bigger uh, weight uh, mm -hmm. sizes, of course, than, uh, uh, and, and scale of, uh, of implementation. So 
Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks for the answer there. So I will move on to the next one. So I do have three votes on this one. You discussed the impact of the price on carbon at 19.7 billion. Uh, what's the projected impact of the clean fuel standard credits in terms of avoided costs for low carbon vehicles? And understanding that will be significant. Impact of the price on carbon, 19.7 billion. What is the projected impact of the clean fuel standard credits in terms of avoided costs for low carbon vehicles? Now, I believe that this may be a question that I believe Dr. Lazell might have a little bit more uh, experience on. I was kind of hoping you'd be able to answer it, Zach, because I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's a, it's a really good question. I think what is the impact of the clean fuel standard and how it work? Uh, I'd love to hear, um, you know, from uh, Mark Kirby, he might have some better insights into it. I mean, one of the things is that uh, hydrogen um, in the clean fuel center, my understanding is hydrogen is seen, you know, as a as a potential clean fuel. And uh, and so, in fact, this could be incentivized um, to, to help keep the price of, of hydrogen down and make it competitive. Uh, and even what we are hoping to see is that the price of the fuel, and especially on our on our uh, total cost of ownership of the vehicle will actually be uh, more cost effective than continuing use of diesel. So that's that's our hope within the next few years. Excellent, thanks for that. I'll move on to the next question. So it says, apologies if I missed this, but are you assuming that retrofitting trucks to burn hydrogen and diesel extends the life of the trucks? And if not, why does it need to slow adoption of hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles? Uh, with our current assumptions, um, I, I, I apologize if, if maybe I, or some things I was saying was alluding to that, but um, uh, with the hydrogen diesel dual fuel trucks, we are assuming that the lifespan of those trucks are going to be very similar to current existing diesel uh, ICE engines because uh, it is basically taking your standard uh, diesel internal combustion engine and retrofitting it with fuel injectors for hydrogen, it's still the same combustion process, it's still the same lossy process with uh, lower efficiency. And so the life cycle of these trucks should be um, similar to, like very quite similar to existing diesel ICEs. I think that uh, the interesting thing would be is that uh, as hydrogen does burn hotter than diesel does, it is possible that it may lead to a very, very, very slight decrease in the lifespan of those engines and maybe an increase in the maintenance. Uh, and then the last part of your question was if... It said, if not, why does it need to slow adoption of hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles? I think it lead to rather than need to is the way it was to be written. Yeah. And so in, in terms of slowing down the adoption, the, the thought process is that, you know, within the modeling that we've done for the hydrogen fuel cell electric only scenario, we are quite far behind within this transition. And so the hope is that with hydrogen diesel dual fuel uh, trucks, we can, these retrofits are a lot easier to perform on existing trucks with, ex with existing technologies that we have. And so we can get the numbers of these trucks produced up much faster because the technology already exists uh, than we can with these hydrogen fuel cell electric. So not necessarily that we'd be extending the lifespan of these trucks, but rather we'd be able to extend into the hydrogen market earlier on, which then provides benefits into kind of expanding our hydrogen market moving forward into when we're able to uh, fully transition to hydrogen fuel cell electric later. Excellent, thanks for that. All right, I do have another one here. In, in your research, have you considered other resource demands for the additional hydrogen production by 2050? Example, water consumption to produce uh, blue hydrogen and how that additional consumption fits with the current water availability in different locations in the province. And, and uh, also there was a kudos, great presentation and thank you for this question. Oh, thank you very much. I. Uh... I mean, previous to this, I think the most amount of people I've ever presented in front of was 20. So this is a little bit of a step up from that. And so my nerves are getting to me a little bit, but uh, <laughs> I, I appreciate the compliment. So looking into uh, additional resource demands for hydrogen production, um, we, my research has not, unfortunately, has not uh, really looked at the production of hydrogen yet. 
Uh, going forward with the research looking into hydrogen refueling stations, I plan on taking a lot larger look into the specifics of hydrogen production and how that will be affecting both the province and Canada. Um, looking at things like, uh, you know, water resources and uh, expanding that, because I understand that, uh, of course, um, our hydrogen production is done from fresh water, and so that's always going to be a concern with uh, water resources. And so unfortunately, um, I don't have uh, much to say right now specifically about how it does affect other resources, because that's kind of some of the research we're planning on doing uh, later on within our hydrogen refueling stations. Uh, so sorry, I can't give you a kind of a better answer to that for right now, but we we are definitely looking into it going forward because that is a very big part of the hydrogen economy moving forward as well, and the ability for us to take on these uh, hydrogen fueling stations. Excellent, well said. All right, and uh, next one here it says again, great presentation thus far. It was a little earlier, and you may have answered, but we'll go through it. Has a couple of votes for it. Uh, have you considered the role of other emerging drivetrain tech like H two internal combustion in your modeling? So now, what I believe that, that is referring to is talking about 100% hydrogen combustion engines. And so as I was talking about previously, with the hydrogen diesel dual fuel technologies, uh, the current technology that exists that they've been able to uh, perform and that works uh, efficiently and without harm to the engine, excuse me, is that 70-30 uh, split. And so uh, as I talked about uh, as well previously, um, th that split, of course, is subject to change as we go on. As current standards uh, and research is done, 70-30 is what they're able to accomplish now. I know that, I believe it was uh, companies like Hydra have stated that within even the next uh, few years, they're hoping to be able to see that split reach about 50-50 hydrogen and uh, diesel combustion with the hope to be that these engines could run potentially on 100% hydrogen, meaning that the diesel then is only a backup. But uh, as we also talked about, unfortunately, it's not preferred because within these hydrogen combustion engines, it's still the combustion process. And so we have the loss of efficiency, we have the loss of heat, uh, and within the combustion process, there's always, of course, going to be those NOx emissions. Uh, and so because um, with the added maintenance and the added uh, emissions of the combustion engine, the hope is that the market and the added maintenance as well, the hope is that the market is going to eventually be transitioning away from the combustion engine to these uh, hydrogen electric fuel cell or just the electric motors in general. And so we've, we've definitely looked at this in uh, looking into our hydrogen diesel dual fuel scenario, because being able to use our current combustion engines with hydrogen means that we can use basically our existing vehicles to help support the hydrogen market going forward. So, so yes, we, uh, we have it and we are definitely considering it, but um, uh, we're not considering it as a permanent solution because the combustion engine is not preferred as an engine solution uh, kind of moving forward. You bet, excellent. And I think on that same same note, uh, we have one of the questions. I know the first part of it may not be something for you to answer, but the second definitely is. So it's how does a hydrogen dual fuel retrofit affect warranty, which again, that may not be part of this, but the second part of the question was, would this retrofit be to brand new vehicles or only to older vehicles? So within the modeling that we have done, the expectation is that the retrofits are best suited for new vehicles. While it is entirely possible to retrofit existing vehicles, uh, the modeling that we've done is assuming that most of these retrofits will be done in newer vehicles because that they have the longest, uh, they will have the longest lifespan, the longest potential for kilometers, uh, etc. However. Uh, within the economy of transitioning uh, our vehicles to net zero, uh, you know, we, there's only so much that we can do with existing vehicles. And so in order to help facilitate the transition to go faster, if you know, it is seen as necessary or if it's required or if the market sees it as even financially feasible, there is definitely potential for existing vehicles on the road to be transitioned to hydrogen diesel dual fuel. Uh, even older vehicles, newer vehicles, the assumptions that we've made are just newer vehicles, 
because the retrofitters uh, have the greatest uh, potential for both cost and revenue and impact made on those newer vehicles. But of, of course, there is that potential for uh, current existing vehicles to be retrofitted as well. Excellent. Thanks for that. Uh, moving on to the next question, it says, when you looked at uh, hydrogen fuel cell electric, uh, only sales, uh, your early adoption of ZEV sales looks fairly small, keeping in mind that it's hard to tell with the scale. Have you taken into consideration that refueling infrastructure needs to have a reasonably high utilization to underpin this adoption? Otherwise, there is very little incentive to build refueling infrastructure. Maybe you can talk through the 2023 to 2029 timeframe of adoption rates. Sure. Here, I'm just going to read that question one more time just to make sure that I uh, got it totally. Okay. So yes, within the early adoption for both of the scenarios, we have a much earlier adoption of hydrogen capable vehicles within our hydrogen diesel dual fuel scenario as compared to the hydrogen fuel cell electric. Um, consideration that refueling infrastructure needs to have highly, uh, reasonably high utilization, yes. And so that is also another one of the concerns is that within the creation of these refueling stations, you know, there is a certain expectation for how many tons a day these refueling stations need to uh, output hydrogen to these trucks in order for them to be economically feasible. And so one of the things that I, I talked about previously within my presentation uh, was talking about that there, unfortunately, is going to have to be, uh, there's going to have to be a lot of smaller and unfortunately much more expensive refueling stations created in the early stages in order to help facilitate this transition. Because yes, in the early days, there will not be um, a very large amount of hydrogen use, of course, as we are transitioning into uh, the later years. And so it becomes a struggle with that, um, with that utilization in, in that adoption. Because um, as you talked about, for example, you said there's very little incentive to build refueling infrastructure. And so uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the big topics that we talked about uh, in this hydrogen transition is that there is fears on both sides. There's fears on the truckers, on the trucking side because these, tr uh, these trucking companies would love to adopt hydrogen fuel cell electric, but it's, it's very worrisome for them uh, to adopt if you know, current refueling structure uh, infrastructure doesn't exist. It's behind, you know, there's currently no refueling stations in Alberta, so why would I wanna get my vehicle <laughs> if I'm worried about refueling? And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, exactly what you're talking about is that there's that same kind of concern. Well, if the trucking companies are worried, why do we wanna be building all these refueling stations terrified that nobody's ever gonna use them? And so that's why you know, we need the, this kind of working on both sides of this and support from the government to facilitate both sides of this transition to ensure that both the refueling side of things, the needs are met and that these refueling stations are making enough money and selling enough hydrogen. And on the same side, these trucking companies understand that these refueling stations will exist and will be available uh, moving forward. Excellent, thanks for that. And uh, I see on my chat that I'm being told we have one minute left. So I think that'll be the questions that we can do for today. So I wanna say thank you very much, Zach. That was a fantastic job of presenting and looking forward to see what uh, you bring further in your next, uh, on your next paper in about a year from now. So uh, with that, it was great to hear all about how all the stakeholders that are involved in this and how you're affected and how you can enter the market now to get to a, a zero emissions uh, goal. So looking forward to it. And I want to thank everybody for attending today. Um, I think we had a pretty good turnout. And if there's any more questions, we'll get thrown into the chat here where you can reach out and we'll be able to answer that for you. So with that, um, I hope everyone has a great day. And again, thanks, Zach, and everyone for attending. Thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate it.